Grace and peace to you in the name of Christ. So from our gospel, Jesus said in parable, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Well, grace and peace and rejoicing, enjoyment of the wedding feast be to you and to me now and then as well. Maybe you heard the one about the two Wi-Fi engineers who got married. You guessed it. The reception was fantastic. <laughs> A parable, as we reflected, comes from two Greek words, parallel and volo, to throw something. We get our word ballistics from that now. Two stories thrown beside each other. An earthly story, but the important thing is the heavenly meaning. The connections are critical. And so maybe this little summation from a study Bible. The Messianic kingdom is likened to a nuptial wedding banquet. The king is God. The servants are the prophets. The invited guests are the Israelites. The punishment refers to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And the new invitees are the Gentiles. And then maybe a second parabolic kind of word. Verse 11, scholars speak of as maybe another parable of the wedding garment. During this time, faithful Christians cooperate in the grace that has been given to them. It's tantamount to wearing the wedding garments in Christ alone. That's a pretty good synopsis in a way that we don't like the word cooperate as well. It's thought of as sanctification in this case. But in a way, it doesn't go far enough, right? It wasn't just those who refused the invitation that were judged, but the one who came but didn't agree to the wedding on the king's terms. Well, let's unpack. The king prepares the feast in that earthly sense. But we get the connection as Christians, people of faith. And the Lord was making a connection for the Israelites, the church leaders to whom we are speaking that holy week, calling to mind Isaiah 55. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Just come. The king is providing. And in that ultimate sense, Isaiah 25, our Old Testament, which I chose this past week for a funeral. I had a member of the community on the south side. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food. You know, that would be the steak with the marbling in it, the fattened pack, and the best of wines. He'll swallow up death forever and wipe the tears from all faces. The Lord is the preparing giver here. And so later in the week, our Lord uses that word again, <clears throat> prepares. I go to prepare a place for you, he says Monday, Thursday night. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And not just words, no. Going to the cross, then, almost immediately, his trial and going to the cross as King of kings and Lord of lords, but the kingdom not of this world, a kingdom of grace and mercy, the Lamb who was slain to take away the sins of the world and who rises then 
And so it's in this redemptive connection in the speaker, literally, of this parable that there is life and salvation, that there is finally this banquet, this feast of victory. And so our Lord is inviting those who were rejecting him at that time. You know, when you look at the discourses of Holy Week, you find our Lord concentrates there in the temple. He doesn't avoid those who were opposing him. He goes, trying, as I said before, to gather them. He would put it as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Come. The king invites and invites some more. There's grace in the preparation and the invitation. You know, we believe that the gospel is the power of God to salvation. That when Ephesians 2 says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's not only the salvation that God has provided in redemptive mercy and work in Christ, but also the faith that is a gift from God. I think of our Lord's words in John chapter 6 when he says, no one comes to me except the Father draws him. It's the word for drawing is the, the drawing in of a boat to shore. In Anna, God invites and calls by the Holy Spirit, and as we simply receive this invitation, we are given that life, that gift, through faith, also a gift. So the call of grace goes out, but sadly, some refuse and even kill the messengers. The reference is to the death of the prophets. Now, those of you who are long in the tooth in the Old Testament say, well, okay, but Elijah and Jeremiah, Isaiah, especially Jeremiah, they were threatened with death. But isn't it true they were biblically delivered or caught up, you know, without death? I think our Lord is referring to a very strong extra-biblical tradition. You know, not everything that's true about the people of God is written in the Bible. It's written that we might have be drawn to salvation in Christ. There's a strong tradition that Isaiah died violently. In fact, that he was sawn in two, simple as a saw, by Manasseh. That Jeremiah was stoned to death in Egypt. That Ezekiel was killed in Babylonia. And that Amos died at the hand of Amaziah Jr.'s hand. And I'm sure there were many others. The servants were killed. And there is judgment. To reject God is to invite judgment whether here, in a life of regret, lacking loyal, real love, finally, or reaping the consequences of amorality, or finally, in eternity, devoid of God's presence, and so devoid of hope. For these religious leaders, that judgment also entailed the Romans coming in with that siege of 87. The only place left, they scattered all the stones laying around Jerusalem, except for what? A wailing wall. The western wall of sustaining. God judged. But God was at work calling latecomers, too, from the highway. We get our term highway from the naturally raised spot where roads would be originally built. Because after all, who wants to build a lot of bridges, right? You kind of choose that. Well, it refers to our forebearer Gentiles. And the wedding hall is full, and everything seems good, right? It's a place of grace, the good and bad, called by God's mercy, but then clothed with the wedding garment, 
I think of Galatians 3, those who are baptized in Christ have what? Put on Christ, like a garment. And that's where we get a tradition of a baptismal garment from. They and we are changed. But before we get to that last part, at least one invitee refuses the wedding garment. As I said in the children's message, it was an old custom of the king to provide monochromatic, all similar wedding clothes, coverings for the guests so that the groom and bride and probably the king and queen too would stand out a little bit in their case. At last weekend's wedding, yeah, we had that color palette. It worked out pretty good, by the way. I'm not sure I'm recommending it, but you know, sometimes you get something and say, is it gonna work out? It worked out okay. At any rate, don't wear ladies a long white dress. We complied out of courtesy and respect. How much more in this parable, the king provides the guests with wedding clothes. To refuse was to reject. Well, why this ultimate rejection? Maybe the guy having ears and eyes didn't really hear the invitation or read correctly, didn't get all of it. Maybe he was kind of like that fellow in Fort Lauderdale who was seen by Ken, who wrote into Reader's Digest. Ken reported, I was working out in the gym and noticed a man in street clothes off to the side, just watching me and others for about 20 minutes. It wasn't creepy. Just stood there, kind of watching. The second time I was there, there he was again, kind of watching. Well, the third time I went, sure enough, he's there, and I decided to ask him what he was doing. He smiled and said, my doctor said, I have to go to the gym. <laughs> this man might have been one of those spiritual searchers. You know, he's hoping to things about God. There are a lot of people like that. Maybe he was like our Buddhist neighbor who will be very polite when you talk about Jesus and will want to put him up on the mantle with the other avatars. But not the way, the truth, and the life. There is truth about God out there. God is revealing himself in creation and so forth, but the fullness of truth has come in Christ. And the way to forgiven life is through him alone. It is the garment of his righteousness. And sure, it's God's terms, but it's real as well. If it's going to be covered, it has to be covered by Christ's righteousness. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses it all sin is on the earth. And when we receive that, in an abiding way, we're changed. I'm reading a book by Oswald Hoffman. Some of you know that name, he's the speaker of the Lutheran Hour, one of my kind of heroes. Now, only Jesus is fully hero, but one of those under heroes. He said, you know, we can't earn this gift. We can't create our own faith. Absolutely. It's all given. But we can do something. And we should. And that is to join in the call of extending this truth and grace of God. In Revelation 22, it kind of concludes before the Maranatha prayer, Come Lord Jesus, with an invitation. The Spirit and the bride, the church, say, come to the waters of life. And so we join 
in the invitation? Well, maybe in a way that relates to this provision of the feast and the clothing. The end of this month marks Reformation Day. I put it up on the sign. Did you see it? October 31st, 1517. A lot of people walk by this church and drive by it. I talk to them all the time. And just in the time I changed the sign, I bet I talk to three or four people every time. They're walking their dogs, they're going this and that. Anyways, I thought, well, they're going to ask the question. 15, 7, I get the October 31st, right? It's Halloween, 1517. And then the question becomes, why did Martin Luther post those 95 theses for debate on the church door on Halloween? It was Halloween for him. All Hallows Eve. The night before All Saints Day. Well, he did it in part because, well, the, the academics didn't go to church that much. And that, it's the University of Martin Luther there now. It's pretty famous. They have a Nobel Prize winner who teaches there. Wittenberg University. And so he wanted the faculty. And they all, they might not even go to Easter or Christmas, but they came in respect for the faithful departed and their family on All Saints Day. So he wrote them in Latin, he put them up there that night. But there's also an interesting connection here with this text. It was tradition, I'm not sure the church taught it, but that on All Hallows' Eve, the saints not at rest, limbo, were free to roam the earth that night. And to keep them out of your house, you would give them something. Now, I think it's real history. Most people didn't believe that, but they had fun giving some sweets to the kids who dressed up like souls not at rest. Still goes on. They also did something else. That night, they would put on their door stoops preserved food. Salted ham and meat Trout, beer. What oh, yeah. Didn't need refrigeration. It was for the poor who needed to be sustained with winter coming. I told that story years ago in Michigan at St. Luke. And the next year, the Compromands and Youth Group got their lawn carts together. And they went out in the neighborhood and they collected not candy on Halloween, but food for the food bank. And it was piled up in the narthex. And you know what else happened? Several of those households came to the real feast over time at St. Luke Lutheran. They joined the church. God's provision. So where is your lawn cart to provide a garment or some good food? Not just in fellowship, that's great, but for others in need and to share the grace of God in Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.